Recap in minutes. In today's video, we will be enjoying a multi-awarded historical war drama film based on a true story entitled Schindler's List. There will be spoilers ahead. Chill out and enjoy. The movie begins when the German army defeats the Polish army in three weeks in late 1939. The transfer of Polish Jews from surrounding areas to Krakow begins. A lone Jewish family registers as Jews at a table set up on a train platform. From a single family follows a vast crowd, and with tens of thousands of Jews arriving on a daily basis, the single table becomes several tables. The listers make sure that each individual is listed and accounted for. One evening, a German Nazi party member and businessman from Czechoslovakia named, Oskar Schindler, enters a club and observes the Wehrmacht and SS officers. When a high official comes in, Oskar gets generous by buying them drinks. By the end of the night, each Nazi soldier at the club knows his name and is at his table, drinking their hearts out. The Nazis have taken control, and the local Jews have been subdued. Oskar then goes to Krakow's Judenrat, a Jewish body tasked with carrying out Nazi directives and, for the many of the populace, a useless complaint center. Oskar goes straight to the front of a seemingly endless line of Jews, where he finds an accountant named, Itzhak Stern. Oskar informs Stern in private that he requires Jewish investors to help him purchase an enamelware factory. Oskar has connections to acquire army contracts that could provide the business but doesn't have the necessary funds to buy the factory. By law, Jews are prohibited from owning businesses. Oskar informs Stern that he would compensate the investors in products rather than cash. Schindler, a profiteer, understands that avoiding paying the Jewish investors in cash will maximize his profit. Oskar also offers Stern to head and run the company. Still, Stern initially rejects the offer, informing Oskar that Jews are unlikely to invest. It's either go big or go home. Schindler has set his goal and refuses to give up. He then proceeds to a church where Jewish smugglers meet in secret to do business. After joining in the conversation, all of the smugglers are scared away except a smuggler named, Poldick. Schindler informs Poldick that he will require many luxury products in the following months, which Poldick promises to obtain. In March of 1941, every Jew was uprooted from their home and was mandated to crowd in a 16-square block walled residence called the Ghetto. Meanwhile, Oscar arrives in his new apartment that he technically took over from a displaced Jew. Soon, Oscar meets up with the Jewish investors to negotiate the terms on how both parties would profit. Oscar points out that the concept of money would be useless in the ghetto. Barter or the exchange of goods will be the norm inside the walled residence. The investors wanted a percentage in the company, but that wasn't an option for the German businessmen. Eventually, Oscar gets money from Jewish investors, who agree to accept Oscar's terms. With Stern's support and after securing war contracts, Oscar establishes his factory and hires Jews rather than Poles because they are less expensive to employ. All workers at the factory will be declared essential, which means that they wouldn't be deported to concentration camps. Stern understands this right away and quickly fills the factory with many Jewish workers who would otherwise be considered expendable by the Nazis. When the factory opened, Stern falsified documents to guarantee that as many Jews as possible were employed by Schindler. Many of those hired are not skilled in metal works, but nonetheless, Stern makes sure they are trained and does not affect production. In many instances, intellectuals are sent to concentration camps as they're deemed non-essentials and useless for the Nazi war efforts. Later, Emily, who Oscar introduces to his butler as his wife, arrives in the city to join his estranged husband. But after a few days together, it wasn't working for Oscar, so Emily departed back to Czechoslovakia. At this point, Oscar has no idea that Stern is utilizing and taking advantage of his factory position to save people. When Stern brings a one-armed guy to meet Oscar and asks him to thank him for saving him by making him important, Oscar dismisses the appreciation and somewhat scolds his Jewish right-hand man. Later, the same one-armed man was set aside and shot in the head while digging snow with the others. On a different occasion, Oscar runs over to the train station and saves Stern from impending doom. But before that, Oscar had to threaten a young officer to help him. Which goes to show that Oscar has a significant influence. Back at Stern, turns out the old Jew made the fatal mistake of forgetting his papers. Hence, the misunderstanding almost got him sent to the concentration camps. Meanwhile, the Plazzo work camp is being built, and a sadistic Nazi officer named, Amon Goeth is assigned to oversee the construction and running of the camp. When a female civil engineer runs over to Amon stating that they have to restart the construction, the Herr Commandant didn't hesitate to order her executed on the spot. When Plazzo is finished, a brutal crackdown begins. Amon directs his men on the operation and tolerates the massacres. While the carnage is ongoing, Schindler and his lover observe the destruction from a perch high above the ghetto. He notices a tiny girl going amid the devastation in a red coat, the only color in the otherwise black and white scene. He sees a group of Jew lined up and shooting using a rifle. The remaining survivors are shot in the head. Schindler's lover begs him to return home with tears in her eyes, and Schindler is clearly impacted by what he witnessed. 
The eradication and massacres continue into the night. Even those who managed to hide during the day were not safe. Back at the camps, the guards do a count on the Jews and have them work. Amon observes the whole scenario from the scope of his sniper rifle positioned on the balcony of his villa. Whenever the Herr Commandant sees a Jew lazing around, he snipes them out. With no one to work in the factory, Oscar's business is affected. Despite Oscar's disgust for how a man could easily take a life, he makes an effort to befriend Amon in order to secure the future of his plant and the supply of workers. Later the two come to an agreement. Oscar bribes Amon, and in return, Oscar is given permission to set up his own subcamp and continue with production. Later, a lavish party is thrown. Due to Oscar's generosity in giving the soldiers some piece of whatever splendor like alcohol, food, or money, he earned the title hair director. Oscar continues to meet with Stern and have the Jew do errands. In a surprise inspection, Amon tested a prisoner on making door hinges. The Jew was very proficient in making one. Still, the Nazi officer noticed that he had a small pile of hinges despite working long hours. Amon was about to execute the Jew when his gun was jammed. He tried to shoot the Jew multiple times and even used a different weapon but failed to kill the man. Like some sort of divine intervention occurred. Days later, Regina Perlman, a Jewish girl posing as a Gentile, visits Oscar's factory. She implores the German to hire her parents, claiming that his factory is a safe haven. Oscar refuses to assist Regina and dismisses her. After the incident, Oscar rants at Stern later, telling him that he is not in the business of saving people. When Oscar is done, he hands Stern his gold watch and orders him to bring the Perlmans over. From then on, he becomes actively involved in protecting Jews and begins aggressively saving them. Oscar gradually offers Stern more of his personal belongings to use as bribes to entice people to his workplace. He even helped a bunch of Jews by spraying them with water while on a train bound for Auschwitz. On Oscar's birthday, he kissed a Jewish girl on the lips, which later got him into trouble with the military police. Kissing a Jew was in violation of the Race and Resettling Act. Fortunately, Oscar has some good friends in high places, which got him out with no trouble. Soon, Oscar receives word that Amman is ordered to dismantle the concentration camp, exhume and burn the bodies of 10,000 Jews killed there and at the Krakow ghetto, and send the remaining Jews to Auschwitz. At first, Oscar had made more money that could last several lifetimes. He intends to leave Poland with his money. However, Oscar can't find himself leaving his workers in good conscience. And so, he thought of a different idea. Oscar tries to persuade the Nazi commandant to allow him to buy back his workers. The plan is for him to open a factory in his hometown in Moravia and continue the production of artillery shells and tanks shells. The plan was beneficial for both parties, especially the Jews, because it was far from Poland's brutality and mass extermination. The commandant was hesitant because the paperwork alone would be torture. Still, he eventually agrees after Oscar offers to pay for each head. Soon after, Stern starts to type in the names of the workers that Oscar wants to take along. The list goes from 450 to 600 to 850. Oscar was trying to save as many souls as he could. By the end of deliberating, they had a thousand and a hundred people, and it cost Oscar more than millions of Reichsmark, the currency used in Nazi Germany. Soon, the people on the list are transported to Czechoslovakia on two separate trains. The men on one train and the women on the other. Moments later, the train for the men arrives first. Oscar welcomes his workers with open arms. Away from the brutal and prying eyes of the fascist, Oscar offers the men hot soup. But due to some mistakes with the paperwork, the women's train was accidentally directed to Auschwitz. The women's heads are shaved, and they are sent to an enclosed chamber. They all scream in terror, fearing it to be a gas chamber as the doors close. However, they are relieved to find that it is simply a shower room. After receiving word of this, Oscar rushes into action to make sure the women are returned safely to Moravia. Oscar uses his connections to secure a negotiation with the person in charge. Afterward, Oscar was forced to repurchase his workers and bribe the Nazi officer with diamonds. Following the return of the women, Oscar strictly orders the guards from visiting the workshop without permission and bans summary executions. As a change, Oscar also encourages the Jews to keep the day of the Sabbath. He spends the next seven months bribing Nazi officials and purchasing bullet casings from other enterprises just to keep the factory running. But Oscar's production couldn't pass any quality control. During this time, no bomb, artillery shell, or firearms are usable as a result. It was part of Oscar's tactics to sabotage the production, knowing full well that the Third Reich was losing. As soon as Germany surrendered and ended the war in 1945, Oscar ran out of money. But nonetheless, Oscar takes the opportunity to announce to his workers that they are now free. But he needed to depart before midnight because despite being good with the Jews, in the eyes of the Allies and Soviets, he was a member of the Nazi party, a munitions manufacturer, and a profiteer of slave labor. In short, the others will see him as a war criminal. 
When he says his goodbyes to his Schindlergeden or Schindler Jews, they present him with a ring crafted from a factory worker's gold teeth, etched with the Talmudic phrase, whoever saves one life saves the entire world. Oscar couldn't help but cry, wishing he could have given more, and saved more lives. Stern comforted the sobbing German that he had done enough to save 1,100 souls. A lone Russian soldier enters the camp the following day and informs the Jews that they are now free. It's revealed that Amon Goeth was arrested and hanged at Krakow for his crimes against humanity. Meanwhile, Oscar failed at his marriage and several businesses after the war. On the bright side, Oscar was declared a righteous person by the Council of the Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. The scene then dissolves into full color as they move toward a nearby town, revealing a group of the real Holocaust survivors walking across a field. The movie ends with the real Schindler Jews putting rocks on Oscar's grave in respect and in honor of their benefactor and savior. Walking alongside the actors are the real life Schindler Jews. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more videos like this and to help the channel grow.